Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> um, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Karen Bishop, and I'm with Lindner Center of Hope, and I work in the marketing and outreach department. And it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking our community partners um, who have helped us um, to get to be able to host a great event like this tonight and also um, help and thank the Countryside Y. Um, this is such a beautiful facility and um, we sure appreciate their generosity and by letting us use this um, space. So um, if you all aren't familiar with Leonard Center of Hope, maybe some of you are, some of you aren't, let me just um, do a little um, introduction about Leonard Center of Hope services. We're located in Mason, Ohio, um, right same exit as Kings Island, and um, we're a large nonprofit mental health center. So we have over 60 full-time clinicians that work for us, and um, those include psychologists, psychiatrists, neuropsychologists, nurse practitioners, social workers, um, many, many brilliant minds that work right there on Old Western Railroad. So um, we offer adult and adolescent outpatient services. Um, we also offer residential services um, for adults. And that's for, um, we have two different units. One is for adult stabilization. And the other one, the other unit um, we call Sipsy House. And that is where we do um, diagnostic assessments for adults. So somebody who might require psychiatric testing, um, we have a 10-day program for psych testing there. Uh, we also have a track for OCD, and we also work with a lot of patients with eating disorders. So we, we treat mental health and addiction um, for both adults um, and adolescents. It is my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Chris Toole. Chris is the Clinical Director of Addiction Services at Linder Center. And I always like working with Dr. Toole. I've seen him speak many times when I go to um, different conferences and he always fills the room. Um, he, um, I think you're gonna enjoy his topic tonight, the internet and how to have a healthy digital diet. Um, I know I can certainly learn some things tonight myself. <laughs> In fact, I'll tell myself that I did give up for Lent um, the um, TikTok <laughs> and um, Instagram. I do spend a little bit of extra time on those. So I gave it up for Lent. So um, I have, what, 10 days left? <laughs> we'll see if I can make it through. But anyway, um, oh, I did want to remind you, um, for those that are watching virtually, um, at the end, you can um, log on. If you have questions for the, um, you can do the chat box. And, or if at the end, um, you can turn on your microphone and ask a question that way at the very end. So um, sit back, relax, and Dr. Crystal. Thanks, Mary. All right. Well, welcome everyone. Welcome everyone on the internet. <laughs> so, uh, so nice to be here. I, I've been a clinician at the Linder Center of Hope for about 15 years and a therapist for 40 years. And 12 of those years was here in Warren County. I was a clinical director of the Mary Haven Youth Center for uh, for 12 years here. If you're familiar with Mary Haven. In the um, you know, work with um, within the juvenile court, so it's kind of like a homecoming for me in a way. <laughs> so we're talking tonight about the internet and then how to have a healthy digital diet, right? Everything's about moderation, and we're going to learn more about that. So part of this goal tonight is to learn more about to understand what's healthy. We also have to talk about what's unhealthy and the problematic use of the internet. Uh, especially in the lives for many people with their kids. But then we also see it, we know that a lot of adults have this issue as well. So we'll be talking about that. Um, so to, to better understand how to have a healthy diet, we must first look at what is unhealthy, what is our awareness of addiction, 
And then how does that happen? How does that relate to what the internet does with ourselves, our mind, and our young people? Can I just ask a quick question about what made you want to come here tonight? And I'll repeat this question for folks that are online. What's the reason why you picked this topic to kind of spend your Wednesday evening? Yes, ma'am. Um, games. Okay. Much. Yeah. So, so there's a mother that has a 16 year old with games, and you feel it's too much. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, we're both technology teachers, and so we want to use this information to help educate our students. We also have children of our own. Okay, so we have a couple of folks that are technology educators. How do I help my students? But also, how, how can this be helpful at home as well? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Um, we're spending up to eight hours plus online for just our work. So how do you manage work and <laughs> yes. social. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, that we spend a lot of time on the internet, right? It's at work, it's at school, it's at our jobs, it's in our car, it's floating in the air right now, right? How do we find a healthy way to manage that? And probably one of the questions is, or I guess one of the statements, we can't get the genie back in the bottle, right? We have restrictions on lots of things in our culture, don't we? When it comes to drugs and alcohol and gambling and pornography, but it's the wild west, the internet, right? And then how problematic that could be. So let's take a look here, what we're gonna look at here in the next hour and a half. I'll leave time for questions at the end. And also I do have my email at the end, so if you have questions that we don't get to, feel free to email me and I'll get back with you. You want a hard copy of this presentation just let me know and i can send that to you as well so what are we going to focus on here tonight uh just gain a better understanding and learn the importance of having a healthy balance a balanced life of digital consumption right it is about consuming learn about the relationship that the digital world has with mental illness this relationship that we see it's very clear there's these correlations with depression, anxiety, trauma, PTSD. We can go on and on. And then learn about the role of nature and nurture in this relationship. Part of that is understanding what's happening in the brain that makes the person addicted, but also what is it about the environment that also reinforces this unhealthy behavior? Or how do I find ways to be healthy? How do I find a healthy digital diet? So when we talk about substance use, and when I refer to substance use, many of us will think of drugs and alcohol. But we also know it can be behavioral. So things like the internet, gambling, sex and pornography, spending and shopping, right? All those things do pretty much the same thing that we see with alcohol and drugs. The brain doesn't really care what it is, whether I put it in my vein, in my nose, down my throat, see with my eyes or do with my hands. The same neurochemical processing is happening. So we see this spectrum of substance use. For example, let's take something that maybe we're all more familiar with, alcohol, right? Now, about 24% of the people in the United States have a lifetime abstinence from alcohol. They've never used alcohol. So one out of four people. But as we move down that spectrum, a lot of people use alcohol. But it doesn't become problematic, right? I can, um, I can have a glass of wine at dinner. I can have a beer watching a game or after I cut grass. It doesn't become problematic. It doesn't become out of control. But as we move down this spectrum, misuse of alcohol. I drink more than I should. I have a hangover the next day. I'm nauseous, right? Abuse of alcohol. We hear alcohol abuse. Now, when I drink, I get behind the wheel. I put myself at risk. I put other people at risk, right? Dependency. We hear that term alcohol dependence. Dependency only refers to the physiological aspect of the drug. Right? So let's say, for example, if all of us here have anxiety and we were all prescribed benzodiazepines, anti anxiety medicine, 
Clonopin, Xanax, Dabamad, Valium. We take it as prescribed. We never abuse it, but over time, we will become dependent on that. Dependent means if I stop, I might have withdrawal symptoms. As I use it over time, I have to use more to get that effect, that increased tolerance. And then finally, addiction, and we'll talk about that. So when we look at the internet, we see a similar spectrum. When we look at gambling, we see a similar spectrum, right? Let's say gambling. Some people don't gamble, right? A lot of people gamble and it doesn't become problematic. But as I move down that spectrum, it becomes more out of control. Same thing with the internet, right? Some people don't use the internet. Maybe grandma or grandpa don't use the internet, right? But for most of us, we do, and it's not problematic. But as we move down that spectrum, we see where it becomes out of control, compulsive, right? So that's what we see here with the internet. If we're talking about gaming, a lot of kids can game and it doesn't become problematic, but for some, it does. And we're gonna see this relationship that things like mental illness or mental health may have that are co-occurring with this, that makes it my go-to, my way to escape, my way to numb out, okay? So let's, let's understand what is an addiction. So ASAM, which is a division of the American Medical Association, or it's a, a branch, yeah. um, stands for the uh, American Society of Addiction Medicine. They came out with a relatively new definition of addiction not too long ago, and they said addiction is a primary chronic disease of brain reward, motivation, memory, and related circuitry, period. There's nothing in that statement that says anything about one's character, one's lack of morality, one's lack of willpower, their addictive personality. It's more about what's happening in the brain. And the second part of their definition states, this function in these circuits leads to characteristic biological, psychological, and social spiritual manifestations. Basically, it impacts the entire person. Every aspect of who they are is impacted by this. And this is reflected in an individual pathologically pursuing reward and or relief by substance use, drugs and alcohol, and other behaviors. Well, what did ASAM mean by and other behaviors? Well, part of the reason why we're here tonight, behavioral addictions, sex and pornography, gaming, gambling, spending, social media, even information gathering. And I can talk more about what that is. Now, years ago, this was kind of called soft addictions. Now it's referred to behavioral or process addictions. But in the early days, it was called soft addictions. And uh, I guess it was soft because they thought things like heroin and cocaine and meth were hard addictions, hardcore addictions. But nothing soft about these. Of all the addictions, drugs and alcohol and behavioral addictions, the one that has the highest suicide rate year after year by far is problem gambling. Problem gambling. One of the cities that has some of the highest suicide rates in the country and has been for a number of years per capita would be Las Vegas. Las Vegas. Yeah. About 34 per 100,000 Compared to Cincinnati, about 14. Twice as gay, right? Members of Gamblers Anonymous have had, half the members have had suicidal thoughts. Spouses of problem gamblers. Not the gambler, the spouse is twice as likely to commit suicide in the general population, right? So these behavioral addictions. Let's take social media. For many years, Rates of suicide in young people was pretty constant for many years until 2007. In 2007, it started to uptick and it's gone up every year since. What happened in 2007? Facebook, iPhone, right? And we see that trend now. So, when we look at all these behavioral addictions, we see how they're problematic. And I'll go back to that statement earlier that 
for, you know, the brain really doesn't care what it is. We're going to learn here in a few slides that how my brain responds to social media or to gaming is the same way my brain responds when I'm using alcohol and drugs, right? At least we have age restrictions on those, right? We don't on the internet. It's the Wild West. You can type in three letters on your keyboard and get graphic sexual images if you don't have any software to screen for that, right? So what is an addiction? Let's look at that. Addiction comes from the Latin word adasier, which means to be a slave to, to be bound to. Having an addiction is about 10% of the population, which is as common as being left-handed. Any left-handed people here? All right, we have two people that are left-handed. Now, I'm not saying that you two have a substance problem or addiction, right? but that's how common addiction is, 10% of the population. Now, this is a, this next slide, this piece here, it's from the American Sign Language. Uh, my daughter, I don't know if this is gonna work, let's see, there she is, and uh, I asked Jen, she's in DC, she works at a university called Gallaudet University, which is the deaf university. She's hearing, but she works there for folks that have, or she's the director of disability services. I asked Jen, what's the sign language for addiction? Let's see if my graphics work here. See that? Hook. You're hooked on it. So it's like a fish, right? So there you go. Something that you can go home and share with your spouse. <laughs> Something important. So what is an addiction? Well, one way is the three C's and the T. Is there a loss of control? I can't manage the behavior. The second C, compulsion. I can't stop doing it, right? Probably the most important of the four. I continue to do it despite the negative consequences. I continue to do it knowing that I could go to jail, I could lose my job, I could lose my marriage, and I do it anyway. And we're going to talk about why that happens when we talk about, start talking about the brain. And then finally, the T is thinking or obsession. I can't stop thinking about it. It's on my mind all the time. When I work with gamers, when they're not gaming, they're thinking about gaming all the time. They watch the videos of other people game. You know, I've had gamers who game 10, 12 hours a day. It's like a full-time job for them to be gaming, right? So what can cause an addiction to a behavior or a chemical? How is addiction related to mental illness? And this is really important piece because we feel, or I feel, as a clinical director of addictions, that many times when a person is using substances, it is a symptom of this stuff over here. This stuff being depression, anxiety, abuse, trauma. I don't want to feel that stuff. I don't want to think about that stuff. And I'm going to do whatever I can to help me numb out. And this is convenient. It's right in my pocket, on my purse. It's at home. So let's talk about this relationship here. This is something I usually have in all my presentations because I think it's really important. And being the addiction guy, uh, I think this is really essential for us to learn. So I call it CUBIS. It's an acronym for five things. It shows this relationship between addiction and mental illness. <clears throat> the C is a chemical. Now, we all have neural chemicals in our brain, and they help us think, feel, and behave. Right, but sometimes, and this, you know, our view of chemical and how they work in our brain has kind of shifted over the years within the field of psychiatry. We used to call this might be referred to in my old uh, presentations as a chemical imbalance, but that term is really on the way out. We now know that neural chemicals have much more involvement and connection with one another. It's not just one particular neural chemical that I treat it with a particular medication, right? I'm, um, I'm depressed, not because, I have a headache, not because I'm aspirin deficient, right? It's one way to think about it. 
But we know these neurochemicals affect how we think and behave and feel. And for some people, this runs in their family, just like diabetes runs in their family, or hypertension, or depression, anxiety, addiction. Not for all, but for some people, this affects them in that way. But whenever I feel that imbalance, and let's say I, I have had anxiety, and gosh, you know, when I smoke at a joint, it brings an anxiety right down. Or let's say I'm depressed. I use a stimulant. I abuse my animal. I look at porn. I go gambling, and I'm regulating my depression with a substance chemical or behavior. I'm trying to find that homeostasis, that balance. I'm using a substance to help with my depression, anxiety, and so forth. The youth, unresolved issues. These are things I don't want to think about. Things that have happened in the past. I don't want to feel this stuff. I don't want to think about this stuff. And whenever they bubble up, I'm going to find whatever I can to help suppress that. This has made it convenient to do that. Let's say I have depression and that comes up and I find a way to help suppress that so I don't feel it. But because it's unresolved, it comes back up again. And this pattern continues. Unfortunately, this is what we see sometimes in drug treatment programs that are not working on that co-occurring mental health piece. Maybe I get sober, I go to meetings, Relapse prevention, I lighten up a little, but then I have something that triggers my trauma and that cycle happens all over again. So not until that trauma is addressed will that addiction fade away. We know at least 50% of folks that have a substance addiction problem have trauma, PTSD. And some experts believe it's as high as 80%. 80% of the folks that have a substance problem have PTSD. So we have to treat the PTSD, right? One of the therapies I utilize is called EMDR, type of therapy that helps reprocess those events and move that trauma to the past, no longer affecting me today. Unresolved issues. The B is a belief or beliefs that are distorted. Our distorted beliefs a lot of times can perpetuate this addiction. Right? All of us grew up with a belief system. It's how I see the world, how I see myself. But what if some of those beliefs that I have, especially about myself, are not true? Maybe I have a belief that at 10 years old, I'm not good enough. I just don't matter. I'm not smart enough. And at 10 years old, that belief stays with me into my adulthood. And it affects my relationships with people, my ability to trust, my ability to connect. Maybe I have a belief the only way I can be social is to have a drink in my hand. The only way I can relax is to get high or play video games nonstop. Well, that's not true, right? You can gain a lot, of, you can relax lots of ways, you can be social lots of ways, right? Years ago, I was in a band um, in town, you know, playing Bogarts and places like that. <laughs> and then, you know, some of the guys in the band thought they played better when they were high, right? <laughs> well, they just thought they played better. <laughs> but, but here's a more dramatic example of this. And we can use this with internet as well. And as you might guess, I see a lot of people with various addictions, and people that I see that have a sexual addictive behavior, I might see something like this. So in a healthy relationship, it starts off with friendship. Then you develop trust, and then commitment, then closeness and intimacy, and then sex. Now we know it doesn't always go that way, right? There's still one night stands. Right. You're still Craigslist, still tender. <laughs> but when we think of a healthy relationship, friendship, trust, commitment, intimacy, then sex. But for some people, because of my distorted beliefs that I have, the way that I pursue friendship, the way I establish trust, the way I find commitment in my life is by being sexual. Sex provides 
a way to meet those unmet needs. So those distorted beliefs that I have perpetuate the addictive cycle. Maybe I minimize, you know, mom, everybody plays video games as small, right? What's the big deal? I'm not out there smoking drugs or, you know, whatever. I justify, I rationalize, I make excuses. Those cognitive distortions that perpetuate the addictive cycle. The I, inability to cope. If you, if you think for a moment of someone who's been a best friend to you, a best friend is there 24-7. A best friend is there during good times and bad. And you can always count on your best friend when you can't count on anyone else, right? Pretty good definition of a best friend. I like to think that person that will help you move on a Saturday morning, it's that guy, right? Well, that's the same relationship that the person has with their addictive behavior. It's there for me 24-7 especially this device. It's there during good times and especially bad times. And I can always count on that drug or that alcohol or that behavioral addiction to do what it promises to do every single time. But maybe I can't count on people in my life. And now I have to give up my best friend, the drug, the behavior to get well. It's been there for me when I had that trauma flashback and I had that PTSD symptoms impact my life. I drank enough alcohol to pass out so I didn't shoot myself. Now you want to take that away from me? You got something better? I don't know if I can trust you. This alcohol has been working in an unhealthy way, but it's been working for a long time. And we would all agree it's not a healthy way of coping. But to take that and to give that up and to find something else, that's pretty scary for some folks. And then finally, the stimulus response relationship. And this has to do with what we know about the brain. And this is very important, especially with young people, because what do we know about their brains? It's not fully developed yet. The prefrontal cortex is not fully developed until we're about 27 years old. The prefrontal cortex, oops, sorry, the prefrontal cortex is that rational, logical, ethical, moral part of our brain. It's where our personality resides. It's where our spirituality, if you will. Everything about who we are as a person is in that prefrontal cortex. It's the triumph of the evolutionary development of the brain, separates us from any other species on the planet. In the back part of the brain is the midbrain made up of the nucleus accumbens and the ventral tegmental area. And one thing that the midbrain does that's very important is that it reinforces behaviors that are necessary for our survival. It reinforces behaviors necessary for our survival. And it does that with a very special neurochemical, dopamine. Dopamine gives us pleasure. So for example, if food wasn't pleasurable, we would have died out thousands of years ago, right? If sex wasn't pleasurable as a species, we would not be here today. So the midbrain reinforces behaviors necessary for survival by pairing it with the pleasure chemical dopamine. Well, guess what? Drugs and alcohol and behavioral addictions like social media, they also trigger dopamine too. So what does that mean? Well, when that dopamine is released from the midbrain, and floods the rest of the brain and hits that rational, logical, ethical, moral part of our brain, it actually shuts down. It goes off, offline. The triumph of our evolutionary development goes offline. This is called hypofrontality, a shutting down of that rational, logical, ethical, moral. A simple example is people who get behind the wheel and drink. That's not rational. It's not logical, right? And sometimes what we see in internet addiction and with young people, when that device is taken away, behaviors become out of control. I've had several parents call the police because their child was so unruly about their behavior with their device 
their game system, whatever, is being taken away. When that dopamine floods the brain, another, another neurochemical is released called glutamate. Glutamate is the most abundant neurochemical in our brain. And glutamate has a lot to do with memory and learning. The glutamate memory chemical tells the brain two things, in our case, about social media or gaming. It says, number one, don't forget this. This is important. And number two, go out and get it. Go out and do it. Because it sees it necessary. So because of the impact that drugs and alcohol and behavioral addictions like internet, like gaming, like gambling, the impact that they have on releasing dopamine, shutting down our rational, logical brain, releasing the memory chemical glutamate that says, don't forget this, and go out and get it. The brain now believes, in our case, social media or gaming equals, just like food, survival. Now, we all know, well, wait a minute. <laughs> I don't need gaming to survive. I don't need gambling to survive. I don't need alcohol to survive. That's true. But the brain thinks we do. And it drives the cravings. It drives the urge. Right? But how have we treated addiction in the past? We've treated it like it was just a part of the prefrontal cortex. It's an issue of character, a lack of morality, a lack of willpower. They're just a bad person. They just don't care. And now we know none of that is true. None of that is true. But how do we treat it? Or how we treated it for a long time? How society treats it? Shame, guilt, blame, coercion, incarceration. Right? Now, this example might be kind of a surprise you, but it's not much different from my grandma coming in and saying to grandma, you know, grandma, if you don't bring down that sugar level, we're going to have to lock you up. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Now, I, will, I do want to say, right, we know, and I know this firsthand, right, addicts will do nasty things. They will lie, cheat, and steal, right? Especially if I take away their device <laughs> or their drug, right? But think of it this way. If all of us would go three days without water, three weeks without food, we would lie, cheat, and steal too. It's the same thing. But unfortunately, the way that we treat addiction is that it's an issue of character. You just gotta stop. Can't you see what you're doing? Don't you care? We use that shame and guilt to blame, right? And I know it's frustrating as a parent, you know. I may have a child at home that's like, I'll be up there when the game is over, okay, mom? Get off my back, right? You hear that story sometimes. Well, part of it is that the brain is saying, you need to do this, right? It's not so much a character flaw or an issue of them being a bad person. It has nothing to do with that. Okay, I'll get off my soapbox here. <laughs> Okay, so we have this nature versus nurture, right? The nature we talked about here with the brain, of course, but we know about the environment, the role of the environment. Our behavior reflects a combination of both genetics and environmental conditioning. Now, this is an interesting point coming up here next. A lot of our research around addiction came from rat studies back in the 20th century. It's kind of weird for me to say back in the 20th century, right? like, we must be old, right? So, but what they did, well, here, we'll just, we'll just talk about, I do have a rat picture coming up, so just a rat alert here, everyone just kind of, you know, exposure is a type of therapy, right, with anxiety. So here we go, there he is, here's a rat. And what they did in these rat studies is that they would give the rat a choice of water, plain water or water laced with drugs alcohol or cocaine. And they found that the majority of the rats preferred the drug-laced water. Many of them overdosed, and those that overdosed, many of them died. And that was our model of addiction, right? If you're exposed to it, you can overdose, it will kill you, period. End of story. Well, this study was replicated not too long ago by a researcher at the University of Toronto, Bruce Alexander. 
he created what he called a rat park. With rats having tunnels and levels and other rats to be with, doing rat things, making rat babies, all those kind of things, you know? And he gave all these rats in the rat park the same thing. Gave them a choice of water, plain water or water laced with cocaine or heroin. And Alexander found that the majority of the rats preferred the pure water over the drug laced water. Very few overdosed. None of them died in the study. So maybe it's about the cage. Maybe it's about the environment too. Right? My favorite part of the study is Alexander replicated the first study. So he had these addicted rats. He put these addicted rats into the rat park. They started drinking the plain water. Makes you want to get a rat for a pet. That's good. <laughs> Maybe not that far, right? I want to share with you this is kind of all scribbled a little bit. One of my other, other favorite rat stories or rat research. And uh, you know, we're going to use the name on our building, our building, Hope. Now, I don't know if rats can have Hope, <laughs> but listen to the story. They took rats and they put them in a container filled with water. They put the rat down in the water and they timed how long the rat would tread water. And when they started to struggle, they would take the rat out. Usually it's about 12, 13, 14 minutes. Once the rat started to struggle, they take the rat out, dry it off, and then put it back in. And in time, how long did the rat continue? What's your guess? How long did the rat continue? What would common sense say? Until it was exhausted, maybe another five minutes or so, or 10. Any other guesses? 60 hours. Oh. 60 hours. Now, I don't know if rats have hope, <laughs> but they definitely knew that if I just stayed in there, hung in this, kept it up, struggled, that eventually that big hand would come down and swoop me out, take me away. Interesting. Another reason to consider a rat. <laughs> I don't know. Can you find there's not a pet story about it? Is there? Maybe fish, that's about it. Well, this, this rat heart was interesting. This next slide was not a research study, but it really had the same results. At the end of the Vietnam War in 1975, one out of five soldiers coming back from Southeast Asia were addicted to heroin. And we thought we were going to have a heroin epidemic in 1975, about 100,000 soldiers coming back from Southeast Asia. Well, they came back to their families, to their communities, some returned to their previous jobs, and they found that actually 95% of the veterans who were addicted to heroin stopped almost immediately using the drug once they came home. No longer being shot at, in the jungles of Southeast Asia, but back home in Ohio with my family. Isn't that interesting? So what I like to think sometimes, right, maybe the opposite of addiction is not only sobriety, but maybe it's about connection. Connection. Now, we have social media, right? Maybe social is not the right word. I think I'm connected. I have these friends, I have these followers, but it's a true connection, right? And you think about young people being exposed to the internet, they never knew life without this device. Some of us that are older, wiser, older, <laughs> we know what life is like without this and how much more fulfilling it can be without this, right? But we have a whole generation that doesn't know that. This is how I connect. And at what point does it become problematic, right? I'm going to have some slides here to say, I'm not the internet policeman here, right? But at what point does that behavior become problematic for a person, right? Because there's a lot of good things with the internet too, we'll talk about that. But this lack of connection, and I think we've seen that a little bit or a lot in our society. 
in the last five years. You know, when there's this lack of connection, what? We're disconnected, right? And some of that we had to do because of the COVID, right? We had to kind of isolate. And that was important to do. But if I'm a person with mental health issues or addiction, I have a natural tendency to disconnect already. You know, I isolate, I pull away. And now I'm being told I need to isolate more. You know, it was no big secret that when, when we saw COVID end, more people coming in for mental health issues, right? Because of that disconnect. So we have that disconnection, which leads to the detachment, right? Separation from other people, becoming more isolated. Maybe starting to worry about that isolation, being alone. That creates maybe more anxiety in my life. Turns into fear. Suspicion of other people. Paranoia. Anger. Hatred. I think we've seen that, unfortunately, in our society. And I think a lot of it, this is my own opinion, being in this field for as long as I have, this disconnect that we see in our society, unfortunately. So how do we reconnect? <laughs> how do we do that, right? And that's going to be a part of this, at least be able to help our kids go forward. So some of you might remember this old movie, right? The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Can anybody name these actors? Clint Eastwood? James Coleman? That's who I thought. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We got Clint Eastwood. Any other guess? All right. Eli Wallach and Lee Van Cleef. Oh. All right. But we did have someone, right, ma'am, you named Clint Eastwood. Was that you? Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, we have a book prize for you. <laughs> <laughs> now, I only have one book here. I kind of gave away my good night iPad, but I do have if you give a mouse an iPhone. So that works for you. <laughs> Sorry, you guys online, but you know. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Mouse thing. <laughs> you give a mouse an iPad. <laughs> or good night iPad. That's that's so let's talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good part of the internet, right? Not everything is bad and horrible with the internet. We know it's access to information, right? We can Google anything and hope it's right, right? right. You know, Wikipedia, you can go into any Wikipedia and change it, right? So people quote Wikipedia all the time, but you can go in and alter that text. You know, the world is flat. <laughs> yes, it is. You know, you know, Thomas Edison says so, you know you can make that stuff up. It's a great communication platform. It is a way of kind of social connecting, right? How many of us have connected with people that we grew up with or high school or you know how enjoyable that is? It makes it so much easier to connect, right? A free exchange of ideas, increase efficiency, right? Think about when you type a paper. It spells it, grammar is it for you, counts how many letters you need, and you know how you space it, just you know, all that. Uh, increased efficiency, entertainment and leisure. Karen talked about her TikTok addiction, right? <laughs> you know, I guess Congress is trying to work on that for right. <laughs> right. Um, Entertainment and leisure, yes. Education and learning, right? It's not amazing that within our hand here, we can really talk to anybody in the world. We can communicate with how powerful that is. And of course, marketing, right? A way to make money in this, and there will be, always be that. But then there is this bad piece, the social isolation that it causes for some people, a loss of parental influence, right? Uh, loss of communication or interaction with the family, you know? Um, I don't know how many families kind of sit down all together and have dinner. You know, we're all so busy with our schedules and this, you know, loss of kind of just connecting with one another, increased vulnerability, you know, 
being on the internet. I'm kind of, you know, opening myself. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, privacy concerns, right? And so we thought our private are really not so private anymore on the internet. Impact on my mood when not online. I see that with a lot of folks. When I'm not gaming, and I'm not able to access social media, it's my anxiety, you know, anxiety there. You know, um, I notice where all my friends are. Why am I not there? What's wrong with me? Was I not invited? Fear of missing out? Those pieces there? Seeing where someone went on their family vacation to Spain and we went to Gatlinburg? What's wrong with us? You know? Do we not, you know, it's all this kind of information that impacts my mood, elements of dishonesty, right? Reliance on false information. That's a big one, right? I mean, one of my, uh, one of my favorite quotes here is, do not trust everything that you see or read on the internet. And that was actually quoted by Abraham Lincoln in 1864, <laughs> uh, 16th president. And, and Abe also did a selfie here. So. And unfortunately, there is this ugly side of the internet. Being preoccupied. This becomes everything that I, it consumes me, right? I know of a case where a woman had lost custody of her children because of the amount of time that she was on the internet neglecting their care. She lost custody of her kids because of that. They were going without food. She was online and they were able to document, you know, loss of control, cyberbullying, and other online harassment. Think about how many kids are affected by online harassment, right? Distraction. It can distract me from things that are important in my life. Addiction and overuse, right? Whether it's a game, whether it's spending, whether it's social media, a loss of boundaries or inhibitions. Things that I would not say or do in person, but I would say and do that online. You know, a text I would send or a video chat, you know. Loss of significant relationships. Uh, I remember uh, giving a talk, it was for the American Counseling Association a couple of years back. And I asked, the group, there was about maybe 100 people. And I asked, how many in this group know someone who met someone online and met their spouse? And I would say it was almost half. I was amazed by that. I was amazed by that. And then criminal. Criminal that right there. So let's talk a little bit more about that, this ugly piece. You might remember this case a few years ago. 11 year old South Carolina boy drove 200 miles to live with a stranger he met on Snapchat. And he met the stranger through his Nintendo Switch. He was playing a game with this adult man, and the 11 year old actually drove his car. Uh, I don't know how you can reach the pedal to the number, but I guess you can. 200 miles to meet up with this man and this chief there in the, you know, uh, Charleston came out with this statement. He said, basically, I love tonight, right now, anybody who's watching this, who's a parent of a child, especially an 11 year old, to sit down with your child right now, right this moment, and have a conversation about what they're doing on social media the dangers, the benefits, and things as a parent that we need to talk about every day. Now, this is becoming more of an issue within our diagnostic field, within our medical and you know, psychiatry field, looking at internet addiction. And we're seeing a lot of similar things that we can also utilize that are kind of correlates with gambling, problem gambling. So these are some of the proposed areas that we see. I guess you might say these are warning signs of a person that maybe has an internet addictive behavior. There's a preoccupation. It really consumes my thoughts all the time. I'm just preoccupied with the game or with social media. It's something that almost I live for. The amount of time that I spent uh, online, um, and you know, when we're talking about someone who's 
10 hours, you know, 8, 10, 12 hours online just gaming, uh, how problematic that becomes. We know more and more about the role that sleep has with mental health. And these kids are coming home from school, staying up late at night, gaming, going to bed early in the morning, and starting that cycle all over again. And sometimes even start to play uh, right in the beginning of the morning until they have to leave from school. And that whole cycle continues again. Unsuccessful efforts to control. Like a lot of substances, when people try to stop, whether it's alcohol or drugs or the internet, they've been unsuccessful. Another warning sign. I try to stop, I want to stop, but I've been unsuccessful in doing so. When I do stop, I have withdrawal symptoms. Just like the alcoholic, when you take away the alcohol, they have withdrawal symptoms. Now, different, right? We don't see, you know, the shakes or DTs, but we do see folks and adults become more irritable, agitated, anxious, more stress when they don't have access to that device or that game. Stay online longer than it originally intended, jeopardizing or risky loss, loss of a relationship, loss of a friendship. Maybe things that I used to do, I don't do anymore, you know? I'm not interested in Boy Scouts or Little League. Things or music, things I used to do, I now kind of get that up. Lying or concealing involvement, escape or relief using the behavior, using the internet as a way to escape from maybe depression or abuse or trauma or finding relief, right? That dopamine reward chemical is access, right? Physical complaints, you know, getting car <laughs> uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, right? I've had some folks who had to get this muscle in the back of their neck fixed because of this downward position all the time. Um, and then not better accounted for a bimatic episode. What this means is people who have uh, bipolar, who have maybe a manic episode, in that manic episode, a person might game a lot, they might drink a lot, they might gamble a lot. So that's an aspect of their mania, not a separate like internet addiction or alcohol you know, abuse. It's really a part of their mood disorder, part of that manic episode. So, so how has this been a global problem when it comes to the internet? In the United States, children ages 8 to 18 spend an average of 44 and a half hours per week in front of a screen. 44 and a half hours. Nearly 23% of youth report they feel addicted to video games. Too much screen time has been linked to obesity, sleep problems, depression. So I guess there's that two-way street right with this, right? If I game a lot, it can result in me being depressed. And then there are those who are depressed who game, right? Kind of works both ways. In South Korea, it's estimated about 160,000 children between the ages of five and nine are addicted to the internet. We also see that the Japan Health Ministry reports 6% of juniors, 9% of seniors, high school students are in a state of internet dependency. In the United States, we've been kind of behind the ball. Well, we've been behind the ball on this for a long time. It's these other countries that were way out in front doing research about internet and gaming long before we started to act here. Actually, in the last couple of years, the World Health Organization has identified gaming as a disorder. The International Classification of Diagnoses, the ICD-11, has now classified gaming as a disorder. So we're seeing that movement towards this. Gambling is now under addiction. Gambling used to be with impulse control. People who had trichotillomania pulling their hair or kleptomania, those kind of now gambling is under the addiction category. And I think things like internet and gaming will 
follow suit in that at some point within our diagnostic manual that we use to diagnose. So there's lots of forms of problematic internet use of digital device use, hypersurfing, hypertexting, hypersocial media, sexting. That's a real problematic area there. Um, pornography, gaming, shopping and spending, gambling, and, we, and, even, and even information gathering. Um, years ago, I had um, a patient who, um, he was not from Cincinnati, uh, <laughs> but he's an anesthesiologist. And he was given warning after warning by a chief medical officer, leave your laptop, your phone, your tablet out of the operating room. And he couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. He lost his job. I mean, I think anesthesiologists make pretty good money. And, uh, you know, think about that. I continue to do it despite the negative consequences. I continue to do it knowing I can lose my job. The true essence of addiction. He was addicted to information. So if he's looking at a car, what's the fiber that comes up? The upholstery. What's the tread line of the tires? Consuming information, information about this to the point it was compulsive, out of control, and he continued to do it despite the negative consequences of losing his job. So let's uh, take a look at gaming and pornography here. So internet threats to children, the exposure to inappropriate content, children may encounter inappropriate or harmful content online, such as violence, pornography, hate speech, graphic imagery. You know, I, I tell this story. <laughs> I grew up in a small town in Indiana, a little four way stop town. And back in 1966, I was about six or seven years old, my parents would get a weekly magazine called Life Magazine. And on the cover, I forget what year it was, September of 1966, was a picture of Sophia Loren dressed in this negligee. And this came in my mailbox. And I usually had a job I didn't make. So you can imagine what that was like. What is this? Right? And it was pretty risque for 1966, covering up the essentials of 1966. But still, it left an imprint with me. Just that one image. Right? Sometimes when I bring this up, I actually have this slide and show that cover. And I actually bought one off eBay. <laughs> and I tell people I take it with me wherever I go. <laughs> but you know, the thing with that, and, and the internet has this link towards you know sexuality, sexual images, right? Now, 150 years ago, before the advent of photography, we might just see a handful of naked people in our lifetime. Now I can see thousands in just 30 seconds. One of the big names in the field of sexual addiction, Patrick Karn, says, we don't know the long-term effect that our exposure to pornography is creating. Our brains have not evolved much in the last 100,000 years, but technology has. You know, we even see these deep fake, you know, deep fakes now, where you can create a video of anyone and put that face and body on anyone. You know, the thing that freaks me out of these pictures are people that have been generated that don't exist. There's no person like that. It's all computer generated. It just kind of plays with my mind a little bit. But, you know, taking, I mean, think about it. if you take that image and what's available in regards to manipulating that and creating pornography of that. Well, is, is that an image of a minor? Is she 17? Is she 18? Well, it's not even a real person. It's just a bunch of ones and zeros that's been created, you know. So that just kind of opens up this other realm that I don't know what's going to happen there in regards to 
exposure to these images. And while we're talking about it, I see some folks, because of their chronic use of pornography in their 20s, they have a retired dysfunction. There is no sexual response to their partner. Just like with any drug, right? You increase the tolerance. Alcohol, got to drink more to get that effect. Gambling, I got to risk more. Same thing with pornography or social media. It's got to be this. This is what does it. This is what triggers the dopamine. Dopamine is not only about pleasure, but it's when something is different out of the ordinary and special. And we're seeing that exposure to this easily on our devices. You know, when I ask people who have issues of pornography, yeah, some use their laptop at home, but a lot of it's their phone. It's always with them, right? So we see that. And that's a problematic area. Um, so going forward here, <laughs> online predators. During my 40 years, 17 years of that, I worked with sexual offenders. I actually started here in Warren County working with juvenile male and female sex offenders. Uh, and then it branched out to working with adults. And so the ease that online predators can access, you know, someone is very vulnerable as a child, right? Just like an 11 year old. Children are vulnerable to online predators who may use social media, chat rooms, gaming platforms to groom, manipulate, or exploit them. Predators may deceive children into sharing personal information, engaging in a, inappropriate conversations, meeting in person, putting them at risk of physical harm or exploitation. Cyberbullying. A lot of times, children may experience this, which involves the use of digital technologies to harass, to intimidate, to humiliate others. Cyberbullying can take various forms including threatening rumors, sharing embarrassing photos or videos, or sending threatening messages leading to psychological distress and negative consequences for victims. We've heard about sexting, where someone is talked into sending pictures of themselves to someone they believe is someone that they're connecting with. It's a, a boyfriend or a girlfriend when actually taking that information and using it against them, blackmailing them. And we've heard about several of these situations occurring where people, uh, you know, the young person saw no way out and then committed suicide, right? So privacy concerns, I mean, we can go through all these threats here. Um, yeah, nothing's really private. <laughs> you know, children may unknowingly share sensitive information online, such as their full name, address, school, or contact details, putting their privacy and safety at risk. We also see just addiction and the overuse of it, excessive use of the internet, social media, online games can lead to addiction and compulsive behavior in children. Internet, internet addiction can interfere with children's academic performance, social interactions, physical health, contributing to sleep disturbances, poor concentration, and emotional issues. Um, cybersecurity threats, inaccurate information, online scams and fraud. So there's a lot of threats there to children. And the unfortunate piece is that, you know, as, as parents, you know, I don't know when you were younger, <laughs> how many of your parents talked to you about the facts of life? Mine really didn't. You know, it was my older sisters had that conversation, I think my parents put her up to it, you know, <laughs> but we should have that conversation about the internet with our kids as well to educate them. And we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a couple of slides. Um, pornography. This is from, uh, this uh, data is from the uh, National Police Chief Council. 64% of young people between the ages of 13 to 24 actively seek out pornography weekly or more often. Oh, I think Jen is locked out. Um, <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> this one really astounding. 
One out of 10 visitors to pornography websites are now age 10 years or younger. Mm -hmm. One out of 10. It's so easy to access. They're exposed to such a, you know, such a young age. Uh, detrimental side effects of uh, the brain. Since 2011, there's been 30 peer review studies which have revealed that pornography has negative and detrimental effects to the brain. We also know that pornography addiction has shown to cause shrinkage of certain areas of the brain, getting smaller. A meta-analysis of 46 studies, this is like a major review of 46 studies, report the effects or of exposure to pornographic material are clear and consistent, and that pornography use puts people at risk in committing sexual offenses and accepting rape myths. A survey of 4,500 adolescents ages 14 to 17 found that viewing internet pornography is significantly associated with the increased probability of sexting among boys. These are kids reporting increase on child on child sexual abuse. 65% of sexually abused children are abused by minors now. By minors who now have access to the internet. And maybe some of that is also reactive, sexually reactive, because of their own abuse and trauma. But we're seeing how children are having a larger role in this. And in that pornography, it's shown to normalize the notion that women are sex objects among both adolescent boys and girls. Girls see this too, that they should be a sex object, not just the boys seeing it. This could also lead to sexual harassment in schools, on the job in, in the community. Another aspect of the internet that we see is also with gaming. Whenever I have this slide, I have to update the games, right? Madden 24, right? Resident Evil number four, Grand Theft Auto number four. Remember Pong? Some of you remember Pong, right? Yes. These are so graphic. Right? They're so realistic, they're sexual, they're violent, all the things that dopamine likes to grab onto. So I have to update, update these all the time, right? A variety of themes of violence, fantasy sports, quests, dominations, and alliances. Now, going back to our spectrum, right? A lot of kids can play these games and it doesn't become problematic. It doesn't become out of control, right? They can play Call of Duty and be shooting up whatever, right? That doesn't impact them. It's just a game. But let's say I have maybe co-occurring issues in my life, trauma and abuse or grief or a lot of anger, and I'm using the game as a way to express that. Now, you know, there is not any definitive research that has shown that violent video games has caused any school shootings, right? I think that was early connected to Columbine where those guys did play some video games. And so that belief kind of how people held on to that, but there really hasn't been research to show them. Now there has been recent research that video games can influence bullying behavior. There is some correlation with that. So that's kind of new. Um, you know, let's say, uh, you know, let's say I'm a teen. Some imagination there. <laughs> and let's say I work at, not at Williams Center, but I work at somewhere, right? And I go in and I make the sandwiches, right? And it's not very exciting. You know, this is not my career, but this is what I, you know, this is what I do. I go in and make the sandwiches. And, and, you know, my life is not very exciting, maybe boring in some ways. I'm just trying to save money to go to school or whatever. But when I go home and I log into World of Warcraft and my rank comes up and people want to join my class, <laughs> think how powerful that feels. Yeah. I feel good. I got people that want to support me. They want to follow my leadership. A lot of my self-esteem is built up in something that is not even real. Right? But that's where I'm getting at. I'm not getting that in my real life. I go online and find it there, right? 
a pseudo reality. Now, let's just combine some of these things, right? Gaming and gambling, <clears throat> loot boxes. Loot boxes are, are aspects within a video game that is gambling. A loot box can be in a sporting game like FIFA, Star Wars game, it could be in that Hot Wheel game, it could be in this Apex Legends game. A loot box is something that's a part of the game, it's embedded, and if I pay money, I can have access to that loot box. Maybe I get a special weapon or special armor or a different type of skin or something that gives me some advantage in that game. Or I don't get much of anything. I don't know, but I'm still paying money. It's still a gamble, right? Some of the game, uh, game designers are starting to eliminate this because they see it as kids, you know, stealing their parents' credit card and getting hundreds of dollars to get these loot boxes. So I can finish the game, have access to the game. Loot boxes are huge profits for the gaming industry, are typically on an in-game container that masks the contents, which are random. Players spend real currency to receive one of these random items. Something cool and awesome, something disappointing. All right, what am I going to get? I don't know. So, top five warning signs of gaming addiction disruptive regular life pattern of a person plays a game all night long, sleeps all day, all daytime. If the potential gamer, internet addict, loses his or her job or stops going to school, to be online to play a digital game. Need for a bigger fix. Does the gamer have to play for longer and longer periods in order to get the same level of enjoyment from the game? Like I mentioned, sometimes when you're away from the game, they'll watch YouTube videos of people playing games that they love. Constantly want to be in that, thinking about the game. Yeah. Playing the game. It's not much different. Have you seen that uh, TV show, uh, Intervention? You know, where the drugs, the other person. Well, anyway, that, that particular show focuses on the person obtaining the drugs, right? Using the drugs, and then recovering from the drugs. And that's their life. It just repeats itself. We kind of see that with gamers as well. Thinking about the game all the time. That's all I talk about. It becomes my identity. Withdrawal. When I stop playing, I have withdrawal symptoms. Some internet gaming addicts become irritable or anxious when they disconnect, when they're forced to, uh, uh, or when they are forced to do so. Cravings, same thing that we see with other drugs here. We also see this power of the internet. All these factors make it really difficult to stop gaming. Accessibility, affordability, anonymity, adventurous, so far. Hypnotic, a way to escape, a way to isolate. All these elements that make the internet so powerful, right? Let me share this video here. And I'll put my mic here so we can hear it. I think it's a fourth plane. We know that engaging social media and our cell phones releases a chemical called dopamine. That's why when you get a text, it feels good. Right? But you know, we've all had it because they go over like the hour and a And so you send out 10 texts, 10 friends, and hi, 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 hi. Because it feels good when you get a response, right? right? It's why we count the likes, it's why we go back 10 times to see if it, and if it's going to get dark. And then my Instagram is going slower. I don't do that too long, I don't like anymore, right? The, the trauma for young kids is to be unfriended, right? Because we know when you get it, you get a hit of dopamine, which feels good. It's why we like it, it's why we keep going back. Dopamine is the exact same chemical that makes us feel good when we smoke, when we drink, and when we gamble. In other words, it's highly, highly addictive, right? We have age restrictions on smoking, gambling, and uh, alcohol, and we have no age restrictions on social media and substance, which is the equivalent of opening up and saying to our teenagers, hey, by the way, this adolescence thing, if it gets you down, 
That's basically what's happening. That's basically what's happening, right? That's basically what happened. You have an entire generation that has access to an addictive, numbing chemical code that are through social media and cell phone addicts into the high stress of adolescence. Why is this important? Almost every alcoholic discovered alcohol in their teenagers. When we're very, very young, the only approval we need is the approval of our parents. And as we go through adolescence, we make this transition where we now need the approval of our peers. Very frustrating for our parents, very important for us. It allows us to acculturate outside of our immediate family to a whole other tribe, right? It's a highly, highly stressful and anxious period of our lives. We're supposed to learn to rely on our friends. Some people, quite by accident, discover alcohol and the effects of dopamine and help them cope with the of part of the rest of their lives. When they suffer significant stress, they will not put into their they will turn to the bottle. Social stress, financial stress, career stress, is pretty much what's happening is because they have a lot of unfettered access to devices and media, basically hardwired. And what we're seeing is as they grow older, too many kids don't know how to form meaningful relationships. They're not online. They will admit that many of their friendships are superficial. They will admit that their friends, that they don't count on their friends, they don't rely on their friends, they have fun with their friends. But they also know that their friends will cancel off because something better comes along. Deep people emotions are not there because they never practice the skill set. And worse, they don't have the coping mechanisms to deal with stress. So when significant stress starts to show up in their lives, they're not turning to a person, they're turning to a device, they're turning to social media, they're turning to these things which offer temporary relief. We know, science is clear, we know. The people who spend more time on Facebook suffer so higher rates of depression than people who spend less time on Facebook. Right? These things balance. Alcohol is not bad, too much alcohol. Gambling is fun, too much gambling is dangerous. Right? There's nothing wrong with social media and cell phone. If you can balance. Right? If you're sitting at dinner with your friends and you're texting somebody who's not there, that's a problem. That's an addiction. If you're sitting in a meeting, with people you're supposed to be listening to and speaking, and you put your phone on the table, face up or face down, I don't care, that sends a subconscious message to the room that you're not just, you're just not that important. Right? That's what happens. And the fact that you can't put it away is because you are addicted. But if you wake up and you check your phone before you say good morning to your girlfriend, boyfriend, or spouse, you have an addiction. And like all addiction, in time, it will destroy relationships, it will cost time, it will cost money, and it will make your life worse. Okay, so well, no. So looking at your, what can we do as parents, right? Do not use digital devices as babysitters. It's really tempting to do that, right? And we know there's lots of good educational games on this, right? You know, so we're talking about monitoring that, supervision, educate your child on the responsible computing, right? Make them aware of what the dangers are out there. Look how addiction maybe has impacted person's family. If there's other addiction in that family system, they might be more prone for this to develop into addiction, right? Identify underlying risk factors in your child. Do they have depression, anxiety, eating disorder, OCD, ADHD, risk factors? Encourage your child to do other things. Get outside. <laughs> Learn the warning signs of addiction, right? Really educating yourself. Intervene when you see problems. And it's kind of this digital nutrition, right? I can't just eat sugar all the time. I have to have a balance here, a balanced diet of vegetables and proteins, right? Sugar's okay over here, but I just can't live on ding dongs all day. Hold on, right? I tried that one time. <laughs> but you know, learn the house rules, right? Remove, remove the television or tablet from the child's room. The computer do not allow TV watching or tablet during meals or homework. You know, this sounds like okay, well, we have to be the police mouths, right? And when your child was young and was learning to walk, you would hold their hand across the street so they wouldn't get hurt. It's the kind of same thing here with the super, you know, super highway, the internet, right? How do I help them to stay safe? Uh, keep a record of how much time is spent in front of the screen. Find activities for the family to do, to get moving, right? Have a one-week challenge of not watching any screen, right? 
Karen gave that up for Lynn some of this, right? <laughs> Very good. Rules for every age, zero to two. No use, no use of the internet. Let me repeat that. No use of the internet from zero to two, right? Three to five, uh, one hour a day under parental supervision. It's not a babysitter, but keep them involved in other activities. Too much screen time may result in aggressive behavior, impulsivity. Use software if you need to to block videos of pornography. There's hardware. The circle is something that's something we use. Hardware to help with that. Um, 15 to 12 year olds, supervised use. 13 to 18, responsible use. Right? Children need to balance technology with social and physical behavior. Screen time is a family bonding experience, right? Try to make it like that time for us to create a new definition of screen time. Um, and then, yeah, for the older kids, this is a time where most of the arguments and disobedience kind of comes up with, as a parent. I have four kids. I've had, uh, you know, uh, child explode. Parents put rules on their digital devices, right? It just shows how that particular behavior is, uh, you know, so connected to that individual. Uh, the rules are broken, you know, maybe that device is confiscated, you know, we can't, we can't just always have what we want. And I think there's that part of parenting that we need to kind of have that hard conversation and be able to set those appropriate boundaries, right? Uh, who are the kids that become addicted to video games? Uh, starting gaming early, six or younger, being above average intelligence. You know, a lot of these games are very sophisticated. And they draw kids that are at higher intelligence, actually. Kids having large periods of run structure time, computers or video games, consoles in their rooms, children with few real world friends who maybe struggle socially. This is the way I maybe feel some connection. Middle or upper middle class families tend to be prone. You know, to have a super duper computer or a PlayStation is like $500, $600, right? This, you know, who can afford that? Right. So those families are sometimes at risk. Children with attention and concentration difficulties are at risk. And males tend to be uh, you know, more problematic. We see more uh, girls and females with that social piece later on. But that early age, gaming is very big. We know about psychological signs. I'm not going to read all of these. It's in your handout. But we know how this impacts a person psychologically. You know, um, just decreased interest in school activities, being visibly angry, upset. Um, this is kind of distortion of my perception of time, greater difficulty abstaining from the game, feeling guilt, regret after long sessions of gaming, right? We also know about physical signs, sleep difficulties, headaches, decreased levels of physical health and hygiene, behavioral signs. Decrease academic performance. We see that in school a lot of times. You know, grades really just start to drop off. Less effort to do homework and studying. Frequent game binges. More time playing the game. So these are just more warning signs that we can be aware of. And it also impacts relationships, of course. Relationships with each other. You know, there's some studies that have found that kids would rather connect online than to meet with them in person. Right. Yeah. Healthy ways to help kids with digital device use. <laughs> Establish clear rules and boundaries, right? That's that's hard, but you know, certainly something that's necessary to do. Learning to uh, lead by example, right? Being a, a good example to our kids about our own use. I kind of get that back because my kids know I talk about this. Dad, you've kind of been on there a long time. You know, yeah. <laughs> but they do what you preach, right? <laughs> but it's certainly to be by example. Encourage physical activities just to get outside and do more. Do more, you know, connecting with other kids as much as we can, promoting that. Uh, promoting screen time, uh, screen free times in zones, you know, limiting where that can be, you know, when we can't have access. You know, at the Linder Center, we have residential programs, and our residents only have access to their phones certain times of the day, right? How can I concentrate on making changes in my life if I've got that phone I'm looking at throughout the day, right? 
how important that becomes. Uh, engage in family activities, you know, being able to engage with one another, how important that is. Uh, and then what if my child needs, you know, uh, needs a higher level of care of intervention? You know, one of the things that we need to look at is at what point this, this behavior becomes problematic, and I need to ask for professional advice, you know, to have a thorough assessment. Maybe what's going on sometimes as a parent or relative, we're, we're maybe too close to that information and having a third party do that assessment, provide recommendations, you know, can be very helpful. So educate yourself. Learn more about internet addiction, its causes, and the effects upon mental health and physical health. Have open communication, talk to your child about the internet use, and be non, you know, to be non-judgmental and supportive in this matter. Engage them to share their thoughts and their feelings and their experiences about this. Set boundaries, establish clear rules and boundaries about the use of the internet, right? Monitor and supervise their activity. Monitor your child's online activities and use parental control tools or software to restrict access to certain websites, right? Uh, encourage healthy habits, promote healthy habits and routines, such as regular exercise, sufficient sleep, balanced nutrition. Encourage your child to take breaks from screen time, right? You are paying for the internet. You probably paid for your device. <laughs> You're able to do that <laughs> as a parent. And, you know, why not have that kind of relationship and establish that uh, while they're at this age so they can have these you know, better behaviors and coping strategies going into adulthood. When they go off to school, we just have to trust they're going to make healthy decisions, right? But it really does start at home and what we need to do there with those healthy habits. Build a support network, engage other parents and caregivers or support groups uh, who may be experiencing similar challenges. You know, the fact that you're coming here and learning about that tonight is a great example that you know this is just a snapshot you know I'm getting a lot of information here but hopefully this will make you more aware of building that uh, support and awareness how to better help your child and uh, just monitor areas of mental health you see things like depression and anxiety and stress in your in your family member you know whether it's your partner or your child and help support them to get the help that they need to address that mental health issue right and then of course see professional help uh, when needed. Uh, if your child's internet addiction is severe or significant or impact their daily life, consider, uh, you know, having them assess and see what's going on, right? Uh, taking care of them, right? And uh, therapy can provide your child with the necessary support and with coping strategies and treatment options that might be available to help them live a healthy and happy life. So, you know, all that we try to do many times with uh, whether it's a substance, a chemical, or behavior is how do we kind of remove or help to remove these obstacles in, a, in our child's life or in a, in a friend's life, you know? How can we find what's so important is that connection with, you know, with each other. There's no big secret that a lot of the people who come to the Lunar Center and when they come to therapy, they're looking for that connection. They're looking for that connection that maybe has been taken from them or robbed from them, and to have a therapeutic, supportive environment where I can trust someone, they can help understand me, I feel respected, um, they're authentic, you know, uh, so many benefits that that can come from just having a provider who can do that. And in our society today, how important that is, how we're so detached in some ways and so disconnected that we want to reconnect again. And we can all do that in some way. Now, not all is lost here. We still have the ability to make positive, healthy choices for ourselves and for our loved ones and be able to, if needed, um, get help to help me do that. All right. So here's my email address. If you have any questions or my phone number, feel free to contact me. I think we're right at 7.30. I don't know if there's any quick questions that people want to ask, or you can always email me too if you, if you have a question and I'll respond to you. Any questions here?
I do have a quick question. Have you a question? Um, yes. So, like, for like the gaming addiction, um, do therapists nowadays, do they, is that part of their, like, you know, their assessment when they're going through like depression, anxiety? Yeah. Do you, I mean, is that a standard or is that? Well, you know, it's becoming more and more. Because okay. recently in January, we started a new program for, for adolescents. It's a PHP, a partial hospitalization program. Mm -hmm. And part of that assessment process is not only drugs and alcohol, but also social media, uh, internet addiction, those kind of things too. Okay. So yeah, we can you can assess a lot of times. I'll do those assessments myself. So, so yeah, it's, it's a child. Yeah, the question was about you know uh, when people uh, um, you know can people access services? Uh, is this something that other therapists are becoming more knowledgeable? I will say a lot more therapists are becoming behavioral addiction therapists as well, mm -hmm. and because we're seeing rates of gambling. We can you know talk about that or sports betting. That's a whole other thing that I can do for my phone now. You know, so all right. Any other questions? Yes, Bob. This question online. One online. It says, "How do you encourage an adult addicted gamer to get help when they refuse to do so?" Yeah. Well, that's a really good question, right? So if this is a loved one, I would uh, you know. Try to even talk with them about this. You know, this is what I'm seeing. I'm just really concerned about your behavior. You know, these are the things that maybe I list some things that I'm concerned about. Um, right? And we can't, you know, we can't always, right? We don't want to force somebody. So, well, you need to do this, and or I need to, you know, here's the bottom line or whatever, but really help encourage them with support to get help for that so that they can see that this is impacting. It sounds like it's impacting their relationship with this person. And so how do I help educate them? Um, you know, seeking out a counselor, and you know, counselors are very good about being able to approach this in a very supportive and healthy way, you know. Um, so if there is a problem that's being um, you know, showing up at home, there are ways that, that can help that encourage that person, you know, to to seek help. Um and to, uh, you know, um, try to get healthy. Uh, it is a difficult task, right? Because we don't always have control of what somebody else does or says. Um, I can only have control of what I do, but I can certainly try to support that person, educate them about it, um, talk with them you know, about this issue, and hopefully they're getting some awareness to be open to talking to someone, a therapist or, some, or someone about about their addiction. Okay. One more. One more question. If, if that's all right. Yeah. And then it's curious, at least to me, and I'm sure to a lot of folks, they say internet addiction is very bad for me. I am told that I am addicted because I take so many webinars and so many classes because yeah. so much of this is now online. Well, when people say that they're addicted because they're coming in, <laughs> well, because they're always on an online class. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know about that. Maybe they just want to be more informed and be educated. And you know, we know the internet can provide you know some educational information, right? Just like anything else. But uh, you know, I guess I would just go back to if the behavior becomes problematic <laughs> at home, if it starts to interfere with relationships, if it starts to interfere with my job. Uh, my sleep, my day-to-day -day functioning, and that's where it becomes problematic. They also want to know, Doc, if on your um, email, if they email you, is it possible to get a, a copy of the PowerPoint? Yes. yes. Yeah, just email me and tell me that you'd like to have the slides. I'll send them to you. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all. Thank I you. Hope this has been helpful. And, uh,